If you spent any time driving around America recently, you may have noticed that an awful lot of the country seems to have shriveled up and died. Take a trip on Route 2 in Maine sometime and count the boarded up paper mills and abandoned houses you see. Or head down Route 23 in Michigan or Ohio and consider the empty factories ringed with barbed wire. You'll see a lot of them. Outside the coastal cities, scenes like this are everywhere. This is your country now. Shuttered car dealerships next to defunct restaurants across the street from thrift stores and methadone clinics. That's America. Community after community. Desiccated. Empty husks with nothing left. Huge swaths of the United States look like that now. So what happened? Well, a lot of things happened. Some of them are complicated and hard to change. But one of the big factors in this slow-moving disaster is the utter transformation of the way our leaders think about the American economy. During the last Gilded Age, 125 years ago, America's ruling class may have been ostentatiously rich, and they were. Go to Newport, Rhode Island for proof, if you like. But it was still a recognizably American class. Tycoons accumulated fortunes, but they also felt some obligation to the country around them. Steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie famously built stone libraries around the country for the edification of people beneath him. John D. Rockefeller and many other so-called robber barons set aside huge portions of their wealth and, in some cases, their property to make this country better. Yellowstone, Acadia National Park, etc. Maybe most significantly, in January of 1914, Henry Ford more than doubled the prevailing factory wage to a then remarkable $5 for an eight-hour day. Ford didn't have to do that, but his company was succeeding and he thought he should. Some historians trace the creation of the American middle class to that decision. Either way, it is nearly impossible to imagine a big company doing anything like that today. Attitudes are just too different. Your average finance mogul looks at workers merely as cost to be reduced or eliminated entirely. Private equity isn't building a lot of public libraries these days. Instead, the model is ruthless economic efficiency. Buy a distressed company, outsource the jobs, liquidate the valuable assets, fire middle management, and once the smoke is cleared, dump what remains to the highest bidder, often in Asia. It's happened around the country. It has made a small number of people phenomenally rich. One of them is a New York-based hedge fund manager called Paul Singer, who, according to Forbes, has amassed a personal fortune of more than $3 billion. How has Singer made that money? We made a lot of it by purchasing sovereign debt from financially distressed countries, countries that were in trouble, usually at a massive discount. Once a country's economy regains some stability, Singer would bombard its government with lawsuits, a massive public relations campaign originating here in Washington, sometimes, until he made his money back with interest. The practice is called vulture capitalism, feeding off the carcass of a dying nation. In some ways, it's not so different from what Singer and his firm, Elliott Management, have done in this country and to this country. Over the past couple of decades, Elliott Management has made billions by buying large stakes in American companies, then firing workers, driving up short-term share prices, and in some cases taking government bailouts, insult to injury. Bloomberg News once described Singer as, quote, the world's most feared investor. And that tells you a lot. No one's even pretending Paul Singer's tactics are good for anyone but Paul Singer and his fund. Consider the case of Delphi, the automotive parts supplier. During the last financial crisis, a consortium of hedge funds, including Singer's Elliott Management, purchased Delphi. With Singer and the other funds at the helm, the company took billions of dollars in government bailouts paid for by you. Obama's auto czar compared those tactics to extortion, but they continued anyway. Once they had the bailout money, the funds moved most of Delphi's jobs overseas and then either cut retiree pensions entirely or shifted the cost to taxpayers. With later financial commitments at home and cheap factories abroad, Delphi's stock soared. According to investigative reporter Greg Pallast, of the 29 Delphi plants in operation when the hedge fund started buying Delphi's debt, only four were still operating in the United States by 2012. That means tens of thousands of unionized and white-collar workers lost their jobs. Paul Singer's hedge fund cashed out for more than a billion dollars. See how that works? Well, some countries, including the United Kingdom, have banned this kind of behavior. It bears no resemblance whatsoever to the capitalism we were promised in school. It creates nothing. It destroys entire cities. It couldn't be uglier or more destructive. So why is it still allowed in the United States? The short answer? Because people like Paul Singer have tremendous influence over our political process. Singer himself was the second largest donor to the Republican Party in 2016. He's given millions to a super PAC that supports Republican senators. 
You may never have heard of Paul Singer, which tells you a lot in itself, but in Washington, he is rock star famous. And that may be why he's almost certainly paying a lower effective tax rate than your average fireman. Just in case you're still wondering if our system is rigged. Oh, yeah, it is. Tonight, we want to tell you a little more about how Paul Singer.